Jason. Of this time before the Lord. we can have a seat. It's going to be a short time of um, interaction this morning, and I'm hoping that God will inspire us and let God's fire be in our hearts, burning for Him in a way that He can use us. It's a privilege when God uses a man. Because there's nothing you can offer God that measures up to the fact that he can't want to use you. So I want to appreciate um, Pastor Chuba and Mommy MJ and everyone else in the leadership for this wonderful privilege to be here and to share testimonies and God's word in just a little way. Uh, it's a privilege because it's not because I have, I'm doing something or I've done something, but I believe that God can use anybody at any time. And I believe God will use you also in the name of Jesus. And knowing that this is a church where I have really gained a lot, you know, growing up as a young person in those days and I wasn't really like I was going to Deeper Life Bible Church that much, but all their programs were very inspirational to me, and I will still out, sometimes still out of campus times, and go for some of those programs and really get very 
challenged and fired up to knowing more about God and serving Him. Even though these days I, I wonder if it, is this really the way it used to be in those days, you know, being in those places and having experiences that, you know, sometimes you, you, people see you as being weird or see the doctrines then as being kind of very stringent. And um, I still remember one uncle that I had in those days, if I would refuse to go get him alcohol or, you know, cigarettes and tobacco to smoke, he would be so, so upset with me, saying, why, out of all, all these other churches, why is it the doctrines of the Bible Church you're kind of, you know, staying with and all of that? But one thing I know is that the church of God is moving forward. And the gate of hell can never prevail against the church. Can we turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 2? I want to be reading from there. And I'm, I want to hope that you will see God's word coming directly to you as a church from that scripture. As I read from Revelation chapter 2, starting from verse 2. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them with thou cannot bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored. All the words, all the words I want you to note there is the, the word works, labor, and labor. We're going to be making references to those words later. And has not fainted. Verse 4 says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. God forbid, right? But this thou hast, and thou hatest the deeds of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Sometimes to tell you how much we need to listen to God, he's not even expecting you to use two ears to, to hear. See, if you have just an ear, you should be able to, to learn and you should be able to listen to him. And um, so I just want to appreciate God for all of those gold standards and hallmarks and um, landmarks that we used to have and I believe we still have now. In, in this great church of God, uh, you know, all of those dress codes and what people eat and things. But as much as people water things down, one thing I want to leave with this church as a challenge is that get back to those things. Why? Because um, there's something called the gold standard, all right? By God's grace, I'm, I'm a chemical pathologist it's something called a gold standard. If you want to run some tests, chemical tests, there will be a gold standard that others measure to. So no matter how much other tests give you similar result that you can still trust, you try to place it side by side with the gold standard. My impression about this church is that it's a gold standard church and should not be watered down for any reason just to please people or to have people, you know, give us some kind of ovation and acceptance. No. Deeper Life Bible Church should stick to what the gold standard or what they used to do and keep doing it because others are looking up to you to be able to you know how know how best to live their lives. Last year when I had a leading by God's grace to reach out to Delaware where I live, I, I was doing all of this sign thing. The pastor has shown you some of the pictures, but I, I had the opportunity of making this right 
in pastor's house while he was sleeping. Maybe he was praying. But I had the opportunity of doing this and doing that. You know, it's just a simple artwork where sometimes I have to do digitally design thing. Now, it came up as an inspiration because I had seen a man in the particular city God had sent me to, you know, reach out to. When I got to that city in Middletown of Delaware, it was like I was nowhere, you know. And um, I didn't know what to do, where to start. I felt like I should start dropping, you know, track of people's doors. But it looked like those kind of old cities, you know, those kind of old cities where they have historic landmarks and you're not too sure what of things there. So I was a little kind of, um, well, I wouldn't say scared, but I was careful to be sure people don't have to call the cops on me because I was doing that as a black man in probably a white community, you know, coming to people's doors, knock, and drop tracks and materials. Well, later on, I saw a man, as, as I was praying for that city, who who stay somewhere and, you know, be making his hands, like gesticulating, saying something. But to me, whatever he was saying was not very audible because he didn't have a public address system. So at some point, I thought maybe he was trying to beg for something. Maybe he was begging for favor from the cars passing. So one of those days, I had to stop my car and went over to him to just know what he was doing. And I discovered this man was saying things like, I love you, Jesus loves you. He was just saying a few things that looked like he was preaching. See, it was at that point, you know, the inspiration came like, why don't you put some of those things this man is saying in form of signs? See that while people are driving through, it becomes like a drive-through church. People see it and, 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 and I wanted to just know, Lord, it's just kind of very scriptural. And that same voice gave me Isaiah chapter 42. It says in that place that he has a servant who does not need to lift his voice on the street, but he will not break or, or, or read. He will not do so much, but he will make impact as a sign. I said, okay, I'm getting this as an inspiration with a kind of confirmation from scriptures to doing it. So I took time today making a lot more of these signs than some were really big and heavy with wood, you know, and I will go to the same spot where this man will be because he only comes at that time. He only came like once a week, and which was like on Sunday morning, I think. So my assignment was like an everyday assignment to the place. So I will stand there with the signs, making different signs and different messages for different times and days. And um, I saw that a lot of people were responding. You know, people literally would come to you and say they want to give their life to Christ. I remember standing around uh, one of those campuses there at Delaware. As I was lifting the sign, a lady walked up to me and asked, why do you do this? So I tried to explain to her that I'm giving people the opportunity to give their life to Christ, and he, she said she was ready to do that. And then she, she, she said she had something to confess. She's into you know, drug addictions and stuff, and she would like to work, but because of her records in terms of drug things, they would not really like hire her at that time. Then I said, okay, let's do the first thing. The first thing is you give your life to Jesus first. And she did that, and we prayed for the second part. And I'm telling you, the same evening, I think, she sent me a text message and said God has given her a job. You see, God can transform people's lives as we put out what we want God to do for us. So I'm going to stop there with those testimonies a little bit and leave it towards the end since we don't have so much time. And I want us to look at a message that I titled the ultimate hire at the 11th hour. The ultimate hire at the 11th hour. If you have your Bible or if you can project it on the screen, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And I want to believe God 
today that someone will get hired by heaven and if you've lost your place in God's hire and position God will restore it to you in the name of Jesus can I have a bigger amen, amen. that is so important because one of the things you don't want to do is to lose relevance and what God is doing is a very, very dangerous state to be at at any time in life. I'm reading, for the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that, had, that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and, said, and saw others standing idle in the, in the where? In the where? Just want to be sure you're following. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And the Bible says in verse 5, Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out. And that was the last time he had to go out searching for those who will work and did likewise. And about 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle. In this kingdom, there's no place for idleness. You cannot come to a, a church like this and you're not involved. I, I overheard the pastor saying something about people getting involved with things. You cannot do that. Is very dangerous, for the Bible says, Woe unto him who is at ease in Zion. It's a very dangerous thing. When you come into this kingdom, it means there is a place for you in there, and you need to occupy that place and do what God has for you to do. What did they say to the master there in verse 7? They say, No man had hired us. He didn't take that as an excuse. He said, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. The Bible says in verse 8, So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, they were hired about eleven hour, and received every man a penny. I'm going to just jump to verse verse 16 it says so the last shall be first and the first last for many be called but few chosen the question I will ask you or ask myself is that why is it that many are called but few are chosen why is it it means there will definitely have been some kind of criteria or requirement that will bring in what looks like the selection. Does that make sense to anybody? Like kind of a, a selective or a criteria or a process where if many are called, just like people apply for something, so few are enlisted based on certain you know, criteria or requirement. And that is the reason why we need to talk about this. Jesus means business in the higher at the 11th hour. Yesterday, as I was riding to, to Fayetteville, I've never felt that guilty in a long time. Yes, it looked like I was going there too evangelize and do and preach the gospel. But I came to the point where an understanding dawned on me as I was meditating on God's word in that boss ride. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 to 38 He says the harvest truly is plenteous but what? The laborers are few. Now, what came to my mind was quite different. Can you picture 
a ripe farm or garden or harvest. I don't know what fruit or crop you like the most. Let's say someone like Ebuka, he's my friend, so I can call his name right here, right? And there'll be no problem. Let's say he likes apples. Do you like apple? And you put someone in a garden or farm full of apples, and the job description is harvest these apples. Then after one hour, two hours, three hours, 12 hours, he comes out of that garden with no apple. What will you think? Something is wrong, right? Because it's already ripe, ready for harvest. But nothing is coming out of that garden. It means whoever is sent to reap that harvest has problem. When that came to my mind while I was writing, I felt very guilty. Like, we have no reason not to harvest this world that Jesus has said is already ripe, ready for harvest. What's the reason why we cannot harvest? What's the reason why you're not winning any soul? What's the reason why you don't have anyone you can present to church on a Sunday, on a Monday, on a Tuesday? You're going the whole week, the whole month, sometimes the whole year. And you cannot say, Lord, out of this harvest field that is filled with fruit that are already ripe for harvest. I went into a garden that is ripe and I came out with nothing. Something is really wrong. So then I started asking him for mercy right in that bottle. Like, I don't know who I have missed or people that I'm supposed to reach out to and people that we need to, you know, you know, get to the kingdom, and we're not doing that. Why is 11th hour very important? It is the last hour of the day, right? Am I correct? Sorry, I'm not like a usual pastor, so I might want some response from you, all right? Now, if you have an 11th hour, the last hour, and the job is the job of harvest. What I reasoned out while meditating on this is this. That is what shows that something has been going on on that farmland, on, on that garden. Am I correct? All of the purchase of the land or lease or whatever has gone into that land, all the, you know, the planting, the weeding, all of those in the spring of maybe uh, insecticides or whatever that has been done, all of those investment is a waste if there's no harvest. Am I correct? It's a waste. Because you did all of that farm and it is not ripe. And nobody goes there to harvest it and probably take it to Walmart or take it to food co or take it to where it could be eaten or bring it to the table or let the people have it. So all of that effort is going to be a waste. And that is why Jesus made it a real serious thing in that Matthew chapter 9 where he says, the harvest is truly plenteous, but I'm still looking for people. And who are those people called? Can I have an answer? Laborers. In fact, I want us to look at that scripture a little a little closely. Can we turn to Matthew chapter 9 from verse 35? If we can get it from verse 35. If I can't see it, I can paraphrase what is there, but we'll go to verse 36. But what I want you to see in those two or three verses that Jesus said, the Bible said Jesus saw the multitudes, right? He was moved with compassion and he said to his disciples, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Am I correct? And he says, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth 
laborers into the vineyard. There are three sets of people there. If you look closely, right? The first set will be multitude, right? The second set will be who? The disciples. Am I correct? And the third set of people that Jesus said they are very few will be the laborers. And those are the people that are so much of a concern to him. Among those disciples were Jesus' appointed apostles. Peter was there. So what does that mean to you? You can be a worker in church, in the choir, you can be a pastor of the church and not be a laborer. You can be the prayer band leader, whatever you are in the church and still not be a laborer. And it's, Jesus will still be asking out of the disciples, out of the disciples, whoever, whatever position you're holding, I still need a set of people and those people are called laborers. And their job description is what amazes me the most. What is the job description of a laborer? What is the job description of a laborer? If you look at dictionary meanings, it just says someone who does an unskilled labor. An unskilled work, no skill required. And because no skill is required, it takes away unnecessary excuses like, Lord, I'm not trained that, Lord, I, I, I didn't learn that, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. Why? Because God's scripture has to be fulfilled. He says, thou art inexcusable, O man. So no matter what excuse you give to God, it, does not, it doesn't fly. Remember some of the times that Jesus had people who said, I want to follow you. I want to do this. I want to do that. He said, okay, he told one man, foxes uh, have holes and all of that. The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Because he knew that man would be considering the comfort of accommodation to be able to make that. So that was the end of that discussion. Somebody else was called or somebody else showed interest. What did he say? Oh, I want to go bury someone. There's nothing wrong with going for somebody's funeral. But not at the expense of his lordship. We're going to get to come to lordship later on. All right? And we begin to weigh what means a lot more to God because value system is the reason why the church is where we are at today. What's your value system? All right, the, the third person says something else like, I want to go do this, I want to go do that. He said, hey, if you put your hand on the plow and look back, you are not fit. So you can see where all of the differences begin to come in while you can be a disciple and not be a laborer because it, it requires something beyond discipleship. Don't mind me if I sound like I'm, I'm a bit hard, but we need to say this thing the way it's supposed to be said. Jesus requires more from you as a disciple. One of those days I was still looking at the word disciple and looking at what it means. Do you know that a disciple has left, is supposed to have left everything to follow Jesus, right? When Jesus came to the first set of people that were called disciples who were fisher men, right? He called them, and the Bible said they left everything. They left their father, they left the nets, and followed him. So it looked like being a disciple was like you're giving up everything. So how come there's still another level? Of requirement where the disciple can be demarcated from another set of people he call laborers who are the ones who will be able to harvest this world needs harvesting sometimes I'll be on the street and I will have tears 
I remember one of those cities in Butte, Montana. I was, I was just weeping as I was walking down the street, the highway of that, of that place because it was so overwhelming how we have a lot of people have issues. You know, some drunk, some, you know, demoniacs or insane. And, and you were just overwhelmed. Like, Lord, what can I do? You just finished praying for this one. You have to turn to pray for another one. You turn to pray for another one. And you're like, out of these thousands or hundreds of souls, you probably got home with two, three, four, five, six for that day. So what happens to the other ones? A multitude are in the valley of decision. If it doesn't mean anything to you to tell you the truth, you're not supposed to be in the church. If it doesn't mean anything to you that people die almost every second going to hell. You know, there was this story I, I, I read from somewhere where a condemned criminal, he was supposed to be hung or, or electrocuted by electric chair or something, but he was, he was, he was on death row. And in the next few minutes, or yeah, in the next few minutes, he was supposed to go, you know, to be executed. And here comes a priest. Maybe you've heard this story too before. And comes to tell him, you know what? Jesus did this if you believe. And if you did that, if you did that, and you will go to heaven. He looked at him like, are you serious? The preacher like, yeah. He, he was almost screaming like, and you were talking about it like this? You mean like, I would go to heaven with all I did and the fact that I'm going to, you know, get saved and that will be all just there? The preacher said this. So the, 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 the condemned criminal was so disappointed in even the way this supposed preacher or whoever was trying to present things about the kingdom. Why? Because there's no fire there. The heart is not there. Even the prayer that the Bible says God attends to, what does the Bible call it? It's the heartfelt prayer of a righteous man. It what avails much. When you sleep every day and nothing talks you, and you go out every day making money and nothing bothers you, it's a concern. Why is it a concern? We've been using Jesus. The reason why you can tell everybody you're saved now was at the expense of Jesus' blood. Am I correct? We've been using Jesus. The reason why some of us give testimonies of breakthrough was because the Bible says that Jesus was poor so that we might be rich. Am I correct? Some of us talk about healing. Someone paid the price. The Bible says by the stripes of Jesus who were healed. You know, he does all that for us. Does all that for you. And he only is requesting you to do just one thing for him. And you're all giving excuses. You know, I have this, I have that, I have this job, I have this, I have that. Let me, let me drop one thing to us this morning. There are two things I know that is not in the hand of anybody except God. Your life and your health. Am I correct? So no matter how much you want to fulfill that desire or make that money or please that person, if you're not alive, you cannot do it. No matter how much you feel that company cannot do without you, try and be sick for two weeks, three weeks, one month. You're going to get an email or a letter making you understand that you are not indispensable. And then you will realize that it is only God that has the power to give you life and keep you healthy enough to achieve other things that you desire to do. 
So what wisdom should there be to us? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added unto you. So it's very important we understand the labor aspect of God's will for every believer. Be God's laborer, because that's what he expects from us. If you look around and anybody's kind of sleeping, touch them. Be a laborer. Be a laborer right in this house and touch them and make sure they are awake. So who is a laborer? A laborer is someone who does unskilled work. And in fact, the real dictionary example says someone who does, who, if I use example, like a farm labor, farm. No skill required. What does a, a laborer do? I'm going to the characteristics, uh, job description of a laborer if you are projecting that for people. Like I said before, no skill required. In Acts of the Apostles, I think chapter 3, the Bible said they took note of Peter and John. They said, these men are unlearned. Am I correct? The only thing they identified them was that they had been with Jesus. So no skill required. So what is required? An ability to have an ear to hear God's instruction and to hearken to that instruction and obey. Just like if you're hired as a laborer to just lift this pulpit out to the next place, that's all you do. You just do what you're asked to do, and that is it. And that's what makes you a laborer. A true laborer just, just takes instructions and obeys instructions from whoever has hired him. So a major thing that you need to know is obedience. And you know Jesus said that if you love me, you will obey. You will keep my commandments. Now, a laborer understands that whoever hires him, it is in his own terms and conditions that he is hired. If he tells you your job is by 6 a.m., that's when you show up. If he says it's by 9 p.m., that's when you show up. You can't show up any other time and get paid if you don't do that. All right? The Bible says, he that winneth soul is wise. So it's a wise thing when you get involved with the reaping of the harvest that Jesus has planned for us. So to reap this harvest, we need to be ready to sacrifice all for the Lord. Because of time, I'm going to just look through few things that can make someone, just in the description that I gave before, why will someone enter a garden or a farm full of ripe fruits and comes out of that farm empty-handed? Have you imagined how that can look like? Can you imagine if you ask such a question, what will you say? One. It's possible he's not the right man for the job. And I want to believe that none of us will be found unfit for the master's use today in Jesus' name. You're not saying that amen like a heartfelt amen. Second is that it's possible that whoever that harvester or laborer or whoever was sent to do that job was blind or could have been blind. Means he didn't see the fruit. And you know the Bible says, I think in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 19, he said, who is really blind than my servant that I have sent? So most time it is actually the people that God expects us to do a lot that kind of look like we are, we are blind. Says either the person is completely blind or partially blind, because Jesus laid hand on a man, and the Bible say he was he said he was seeing men as trees. So as you seeing souls pass you by, 
it doesn't occur to you that these souls are walking to hell. So you see them as trees. They can just die. No, it doesn't bother you. You're not seeing them as God sees them as souls, and he doesn't want any soul to perish. Number three reason is that that fellow might be very unwilling. The Bible talks about the, two, the parable of the two sons of a man. He calls the first one say, can you do this for me? He said, yes, but did not go. And the second one said, no, but, but when? And Jesus asked the question, who really did what the father wanted? So it might be unwillingness. It can also be we are lazy. Okay, someone goes into the vineyard, the fruits are there. Maybe it needed you to stretch a little hand and pluck it. But you don't want to pluck it because you're too lazy to lift your hand. And you didn't do nothing. You came out with no harvest. It could be you're lazy. And the Bible says in Proverbs that it is a son that brings shame, that sleeps during harvest. Can somebody lift his or her hand and say, I will not be lazy. And I will not be a child of God that causes shame to God. The reason why we have to say these things and mean them is that it's a lot of investment. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And Jesus was sacrificed. But someone wrote a song and said, He was the treasure of heaven crucified. Why? Because it is in Jesus that we have the riches in glory. And all of that was crucified, was destroyed. So we cannot allow God to be at a loss. Some of the times when I'm praying in the cities, my heart cry is the Lord Jesus, you couldn't have died for the people in this city in vain. And if these people were made by you, it is not fair on you that you're sharing the same people you made with one devil. So they can't keep them bound. And you begin to take authority out of a holy provocation against whatever force is holding people down. So when we go out today for evangelism, it's not to fulfill all righteousness. If pastor doesn't see me there, you're going to think I'm backslidden. And you just give out tract very mindlessly. Your mind is not there. You, you're not. You're not there to harvest. You don't have an objective. There's nothing you're aiming at. So you just knock at people's door, just hand out something very mindlessly, and you walk away. It's okay, we did evangelism last week. We did two weeks ago. We did one month ago. Now, like I said, flashback to what I just said. Someone walks into a garden full of fruits, Ripe for harvest, whose job is just go pluck this fruit out. He comes out of the garden empty handed. Something is wrong. Something is not wrong with the harvest field. Something is not wrong with those sinners you've seen on the street. That's not the problem. The problem is the person sent to harvest them. It's God's problem. And I, I believe God, that problem He will solve for us today. In the name of Jesus. But I want you to begin to identify what area is yours. Don't, don't pass the buck to somebody else. Oh, now I know he's talking about this person. He's not talking about anybody. God is talking to even myself. Because I came really under a lot of guilt feeling as I was riding to Fayetteville yesterday. Because I was like, this is not fair. This is not good. Another reason, apart from being lazy, is fear. A lot of Christians fear the fear that is not even there. I was discussing with a pastor in South, South Carolina on um, a Zoom call where they wanted to know if I would come to their city or not. So we had a kind of conference call. As soon as I mentioned that I was going to go through Greyhound 
And since it's going to be like a 17-hour ride, sometimes I ride more than that, it's going to be a 17-hour ride. I'm going to be interjecting it as we stop at you know, stopovers and layovers to preach to people there. Immediately, one of the pastors said, no, you can't do that. You know, you can't, you can't proselytize. He just started talking. Oh, and are you serious? By God's grace, right inside the bus, we've seen people praising his prayer right there. And people were hearing us. Right inside Walmart, even some associates. I've seen a man walk up to me with my sign because I put it in my cart. You know, as big as it is, sometimes much bigger. Put it on my cart like it's something that I bought. And I, I just move around Walmart with it. So I said, you can't do that? Who said so? And if it is even correct, you can't do that. Why don't you wait for them to tell you to stop it? Rather than you preventing yourself from doing it. So are we saying in the church of God that if the government says you shouldn't preach the gospel, then you should not preach the gospel? I need an answer. I need an answer. Because the disciples were confronted and said, don't do it. What did John answer them? He said, judge ye, is it better to obey you than God? And that was the line. So when your boss or your company is drawing a line that says you cannot talk about your faith, you cannot pray, you cannot do that, and you think that job is more important to you than your faith, then you have a problem. I cannot take up any job in my life, and I really mean it, where I cannot have time to go to church or do what I have to do as a Christian because I have a job. You can go to anywhere with your job. Something is more important. So that's why I say value system in the church is what needs to be addressed. What means much more to you than your daily bread, the house you're trying to get, whatever you're trying to make, and all of those things you're making because Jesus died for you. Now he needs you, and you are saying no to Jesus. Something is wrong. And the servant we saw in Jesus' parable about talents, the one that, that went and hid his talent, the Bible called him wicked and slothful servant. Why? He hid the talent. So whatever God has given to you is something you're supposed to use for God. And more even fearfully is where the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, it says the fearful. God will still send them to the same way, the same place where you're having the murderers and the whore mongers. Why? Why is that so? If you are someone who lives in fear, especially fear that will not make you preach the gospel, you are telling Jesus, I don't have your spirit. Right? Am I correct? Because he has not given you what? The spirit of fear. So you're telling Jesus, I don't have your spirit. And Romans say, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you are none of his. And those absolute statements are not there so that we can learn scriptures, but we can practice them. The same way he says in 1 John, love not the world, neither the things in the world. He that loves the world, the love of the Father is not what? It's not. So it's not something you want to combine. You see, God's words are very absolute. It's either a yes or a no. There's no sitting on the fence when it has to do with God's word. And that's why we need to be very serious in church. Because a lot of things are beginning to pass under into churches, including Deeper Life Bible Church, where we're beginning to accept things that we used to say no to in the past. It is not a good trend. We cannot sit on the fence with God. He says, I place before you death or life. You are either here or there. He hates lukewarmness. And because he can't handle it, he wants us and say he will spew people out of his mouth. And that will not be anybody's portion here in Jesus' name.
but we have to be serious. It can also mean that this laborer, or whoever that person is, does not care and wants the harvest to waste. Do you want the sinners to go to hell? The answer is no. So you have to stand up to what it takes. Or that you hate the owner of the harvest. So because you hate him, you want all the effort he put into that farmland to just be a waste. I don't think that's where you are at right now. Or that you hate the fruits or the crops. I don't think any one of us hates those folks that are not born again right now. Or you don't have a value. There's quite a lot of, a lot of answers. Just that I'm not sure if you're seeing them as big. Okay, but you can you can imagine that it is really a bad thing for you to go into such harvest field and come out with nothing, or you have no value for your job, or you have no value for the master's farm, or you have, or you you just want the owner to suffer shame or reproach. Or you just have a high level of immaturity. You're just a child. So you, you cannot place any value on anything. And that is not what God expects. Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 21. I think I'll be rounding off from here. John chapter 21. A man who was called from the beginning of the same book or the same, um, you know, the Gospels came to the last chapter of the last Gospel book and decided to abandon what he was called to do before to go back a fishing. That's what that story was all about. And the Bible says the other disciples say, yes, we'll go back with you. There were seven of them, I think. And the Bible says that was the third time Jesus was appearing to his disciples after he resurrected. So they toiled all night and caught nothing. Then Jesus comes to the shore. Are you following that story? Jesus comes to that shore and sees them toiling and wasting all the night and told them what to do, cast the net. Somehow, one of them realized who he was. The guy who called the shot to go out fishing discovered he was naked, right? And jumped into the sea. Then when all that happened, and they came to the shore with the fish, much fish they had caught, the Bible said they met Jesus with coals of fire and already had a baked fish with him. Question, where did Jesus get the fish that was already roasted or that was already, you know, cooked, whatever way he did it? We don't know. The Bible didn't tell us exactly where there was. But he came to the point where he now asked Peter a very important question. But before we got there, what did Jesus call them when he came there? I don't know what verse that was, but he called them what? I think that was verse 5. He said, he called them children. Have you seen that verse? He said, then Jesus said unto them, children. Because at that point, that was what they were. Someone is at the level of just a child. When all it is, is about Food, give me this, give me that. Mommy, I'm hungry. Mommy, I need this. Mommy, I need that. That's at a level. We cannot. It's a level of immaturity that can make someone not to get involved with what Jesus wants. And he says, if you are at that level, it's really not good. Why? The earnest expectation of this whole creation, the Bible says, is not waiting for children. It's waiting for what? For who? The sons of God. When a child graduates and becomes a son, what does he do? He begins to share the responsibility of that family. Not to be making demands on mommy and daddy. He wants to know mommy and daddy, what are we going to do? What can I bring on? And that gladdens the heart of the parents. Am I correct? 
when your son begins to tell you, we want to buy a house, we want to make this investment, we want to do this, then you, you, you begin to feel like you have not wasted time training up that child. Am I correct? And that's what God expects. Not being a child, still going for fish, looking for all of that, but coming to the point where God sees you as someone who's matured. But I don't have so much time. I'm not sure where that bank came for. Does it mean my time was over? I'm not sure. I'm not used to it. But we need to have this understanding. You cannot preach the gospel without power. It's not enough to hand out tracts. It's not enough to, enough to stand on the street screaming at people or you know, doing anything. You need the power of God. And I'm trusting God as we pray today, that power will come upon us for anyone who is really thirsty for power. I've seen people literally come and say, I want to give my life to Christ without saying anything to them. So I knew that that was not my ability to preach. That must be the Holy Spirit, you know, by his power bringing them to give their life to Christ. All right? You know, see God's power touching someone, and the person gets a healing and begins to shout on the street. You need the power to preach this gospel. I find it's very frustrating when you are preaching the gospel and there's no power back up. So we desperately need to answer God's call today. Is someone with me? Are you all with me? You cannot do a laborer's job without understanding the lordship of Jesus. That's where I'm going to be stopping. I don't know how many minutes I have. If you have a way to let me know, please let me know. You cannot be a laborer without acknowledging and honoring the lordship of Jesus. Anything can be your God in the Old Testament. But if you want to talk about the God of heaven, it has a qualification. If you look at scriptures very well, it says the Lord God. Am I correct? That adjective means a lot to whatever you're making your God. The fact that he's your Lord is so important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God. So he was Lord first before he could be made God. And what does that mean? He owns you. The owner of a building or a land is called what? Land Lord. So that ownership is so important. You can accept Jesus as a savior and healer and all of that, but if you don't make him Lord, you cannot understand the area of a laborer because a laborer submits to a kind of lordship, obeys instructions, and carries it out. Jesus said that you cannot serve two masters. And if you see that scripture very well, say you will either love one or hate the other. So it's a love thing. So serving Jesus as master is not something you are coaxed or coerced into. It's a love thing. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. Why? He said, because God's commands are not grievous. They're not hard. So they're easy. And Jesus has said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But he went further and said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. He says, My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You cannot live a yokeless life. You cannot live a life without any responsibility. Such life does not exist. In this kingdom. Instead, what Jesus promises is that yoke is easy and that burden is light. So we're going to make our decision today in knowing what do you really love. John chapter 21 that we just read, we just, we just read a bit 
a little um, a while ago, Jesus was asking Peter a simple question: "Lovest me more than these, more than fish?" Some people equal something else: more than money, more than career, more than this. Peter could not answer that question correctly because it was a comparative question. It wasn't, do you love me? Yes, I love you. It was a question that said, do you love me more than this? And that is where the definition of lordship comes back to us. Abraham, do you love me more than your son? Because that's an area we don't want to talk about, the family ties. All of those people that came to Jesus and gave reasons, if you look at them carefully, they were legitimate reasons. I want to go bury my father. I want to do this. I want to do that. They were very legitimate. And they were around family ties and lines. And Jesus didn't spare that. He didn't leave us in the dark about it. He said clearly, if you love me more than your mother, father, son, daughter, wife, maybe husband, Whatever it is that you place on a love scale, on a comparative measure, and it outweighs your love for Jesus, brings you under a lot of disqualification or a review if you are really qualified to do God's work. Because people will say, don't ever cross the lines of your family. Your family comes first. Family comes f before ministry. But lordship comes before family. And God demonstrated that in the life of Abraham. It was like, I'm calling you Abraham. Can you go against your family? Do you know what it means for a man to saddle his son and say, I'm going to kill you? What can be more anti-family than that? You tell me. And he was taking his son, and God did not make it easy for him do you know he had to walk three days to just go kill his son? Not to go collect $3 million or to get a special contract. You're walking three days. And on the third day, God made it even harder. He had to climb the mountain to kill the son. It was at that point, God swore from heaven and said, Now I see you're placing my lordship over even your family. Can we stand up on our feet? To so whatever, I'm telling you the truth, whatever you place side by side with Jesus and it takes a precedence or becomes more important, not your wife. I'm not saying you should hate your wife. Jesus didn't tell us to do that. And, it, and Jesus or the kingdom becomes secondary. You are running a big risk of not getting involved with what Jesus wants. I want you to open your mouth and talk to God. Let the fire of prayer be ignited in us and in this meeting today. I can't hear anybody's voice. Are you praying to God? I can't hear your voice. Can you talk to God? Lord, I need your fire. Lord, I need to review if I really love you. Lord, I need to review if I could be hired at this 11th hour. That I don't do things mindlessly. I don't just go out there as we're going to go out this afternoon. Just do it like, all right, pastor, I hope it's not going to be more than 30 minutes. I hope it's not going to be more than an hour. And you just do it and you walk away. And it doesn't mean anything to you what's happening to that man's door, the man that you just knocked at his door after you've left. We cannot be mindless. We cannot be wicked. We cannot allow Jesus' death to be in vain. We cannot allow all of that sacrifice he made to be a waste. That's the reason why he sent you here, not for you to make money. Money comes on the side when you have sought him first. He said, all these things shall be added unto you. Why don't you wait for his addition rather than running after things, rather than ru more than running after him? Is someone taking this prayer seriously? 
because God is about restoring a lot of people's calls this afternoon. And I'm going to make those quick calls and I'll be out of this place. You want to reconnect back to God. You want to ask God for mercy for missing it. You want to ask God for focusing on things rather than on Him. You want to ask God for mercy. And He wants that mercy to come upon us today in the name of Jesus. Because the mercy of God in Exodus, He said, I will have mercy on that set of generation who love me. So love is a qualification or a pre-qualification for mercy. People think mercy is not earned. I tell you, mercy is earnable. The same thing with grace. Grace is not just a merited favor. You pay some price for it. That price is the price that you love God. He can waive judgment based on mercy. He says, love covers multitude of sin. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. I want that amen to be very resounding. Amen. The first altar call I'm going to make in quick succession, you don't need to raise your hand. It's not a show off. It's not, it's not a show off at all. It's a serious thing between you and God. If you want somebody else to know about your decision, you can meet the pastor and tell him privately. So this is not a public display. If you are in this church and you know you're still playing around, you're not really born again. You see, I keep stressing this point because you cannot claim to be a student of a school where you're not admitted. No matter how much you hang around that school, on the day of awards and certificate, you will get nothing. You're probably in here because your parents are deeper lives, so you always have to come to church. But you know that there's no personal link between you and Jesus, and you're still living in your sin, and you're in this church. This is a time for you. Where you are at, you don't need to come out. Make a decision for Jesus' touch on your life. Ask him to forgive you. Next set of people are people that you claim to be a Christian, but you're struggling. One habit, something you're watching that nobody knows, something you're fiddling around with that nobody knows, and everybody thinks you're okay. You're secretly doing things that cannot take you into the kingdom. Let me tell you, the gate of heaven is not where they modify people's lifestyle, no. At that place, it's, it's either you're going right or you're going left. So whatever you need to mortify is here. And the Bible talks about you can mortify the deed of your flesh by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is right in this meeting. If you will be sincere and ask him for mercy, do not say, I will do it later. There is a grace for and mercy for such people. You want to break an addiction. You are struggling and doing things nobody knows. And you need God's touch. Receive it as we pray. Father, let your mercy descend in this meeting in a mighty way. In the name of Jesus. We ask for mercy and we plead the blood of Jesus. For as many coming back to you in one form or the other. We're asking you to help us. In Jesus' name we pray. The last set of people will be people that you know God has called you and given you an assignment. And you are just playing around. Today, my career. Tomorrow, my family. I have bills to pay. I have, and you're making all sorts of excuses. You cannot do it. Or you are ashamed of Jesus. Or you are afraid to step out. or you, Whatever reason it is, bring it to the altar. Bring it to the altar right now. And say, Lord Jesus, I want to change. I want something to happen. I want my life changed. I want to catch your fire. To reach out to people. To represent the purpose for which you sent me here. Is there anybody like that? If you are there, pray. And ask him. Because there will be a restoration of graces. And mandates and mantles. 
in this meeting, this hour, Father, let your mercy prevail. Let your mercy prevail upon everyone who is coming back to you today, asking for restoration. Have mercy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. A lot of people are doing things and losing their lives in this kingdom. I don't want to tell you scary stories. But please, I'm begging you, get back to what God has asked you to do. Heaven must have a reason to defend you on the air, in the train, on the water, on the road. Because there's something they're gaining from you. Say, so destroy it not because there is a blessing in it. If there's nothing coming from you, the devil can take a chance and take your life away. And God will have no basis to defend you because there's no basis. You haven't created a place where heaven can stand in for you. Your greatest place of safety is in the will of God, which is very clear. His heartbeat is that souls are wasting and you are sleeping. Souls are wasting and you're just making money. People are going to hell and it doesn't bother you. And you say you love him. He says prove it. And I know you will prove it to him like Peter said he will prove it. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Thank you Father. Be glorified in this church. Let your name be magnified. As we go out today release mercy and save souls in this land of concord. And let your name be magnified today. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Give Jesus a big hand clap.